You've eaten Gotham's wealth, its spirit, but your feast is nearly over. This is not my home. It's an operating table. And I'm the surgeon. Why aren't you laughing? From this moment on, none of you are safe. Welcome to the Batman Book Club, a podcast exploring the Dark Knight Library. I am your host, Ryan Lauer. The Batman Book Club is a proud member of the Batman Podcast Network, hosted by Batman on Film. Just go to batmanpodcastnetwork.com for a whole list of other Bat-related shows that also love to dive into some other nerdy topics we all love to frolic about in our free time. And if you would like to support the show, the Batman Book Club is now a member on Patreon. You can just click in the description of this episode for that link or go to patreon.com slash the Batman BC. Thank you for tuning in to episode number 72, The Dark Prince Charming. Now joining me is a pal of mine. This is his third appearance on the Batman Book Club. Uh, it is Mr. Eric Carter. Eric, welcome back to the show. Well, thank you for having me once again, Ryan. Uh, Absolutely. It's, it's been a while. What was it? Uh, White Knight last time? It sure was. Yes. And it's funny that you say that the last time because I purposely left this out so you can explain. Since you've been on the show the last time, you have launched your own Batman podcast. So why don't you tell all of us all about it who may not know about The Fire Rises? Uh, yeah. So um, I had been guest hosting on a lot of podcasts for a while and uh, it was something I was I really enjoy and there was a lot of topics that I wanted to talk about that people weren't talking about. So I decided, well, I'll do my own show. So, and <laughs> I don't, I don't think there's ever any problem with more Batman content. So no, uh, yeah. Launched uh, the fire rises. Uh, most often my co-host is Joe Fornerado. Uh, you've had Joe on the Batman book club a few times. Sure have. Um, and uh, yeah. And you are actually a, a TFR alumni now. So <laughs> Yeah, of all the subjects, for some reason, you got me on there to talk the long Halloween for a lot longer than I think you were prepared for. Uh, but that's, I mean, well, Ryan, I don't know why you <laughs> sprang to mind when the long Halloween came up. But. I don't either. I think I've been very subtle in my feelings toward the, the story. And now the movie, it's kind of like people are people thought they could get me to shut up about the book. Well, now the movie talk's going to just uh, going to take over now about that. Well, movie. Well, well, now if we can just get Peter Vera to read it. I know, I know. Uh, I did finally get him to watch watch both parts one and two. Uh, nice. At the time that this drops, I think that Batman on Film podcast episode should have dropped where we talked about it. And he teased it up really well. And he got my jaw to, to drop uh, literally by an opinion he had on something we talk about. So there's my tease Ooh. for that tease. But this is about you. The fire rises. Uh, we'll plug it away at the end of the show where people can go and and listen to all of your great nerdy talk. So, um, yeah, welcome back. Welcome aboard. I'm glad that you have your own show going. I've listened to it. Obviously, I've been on it. Um, it's it's good stuff. So I'm glad you got that started. Well, thank you. Yes. Now, Eric, before we dive into today's book, I want to ask you really quick, what Batman stuff have you been reading? Since this is your third time on, you've already revealed what your favorite Batman story of all time is go back and listen to Batman Gates of Gotham. Uh, but lately, what have you been reading Batman wise? Ooh, so um, for the new season of Titans, I mm -hmm. kind of dove into uh, what I thought kind of the, the story was going to dive into comic wise. So I recently got the hardcover of death in the family, mm -hmm. which included that story and uh, a lonely place of dying which also works great because now we have a new Tim Drake in the show. Um, and then I read Under the Red Hood again for the first time in a long time. So yeah, um, outside of that, catching up for Titans, I've also been taking advantage of because, and I know it's probably blasphemous to say on a, on a comic show, but you know, I've, I'm taking advantage of the DC Universe infinite six yes. month window. So I haven't been keeping up week to week with new comics i'm i'm just waiting for him to come to dcui because honestly sure. it's it's cheaper yeah i uh i focus more on expensive comics that i want and i wait for the new ones to come out on there so i've just started reading um 
Future State, and I'm reading the Batman title right now, and I'm not loving it. <laughs> the, the, the next Batman, right? The next, the next Batman, yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, we did, actually, speaking of Peter Vera, he and uh, Aquaman himself, Eric Holzman, were both on this show uh, twice to talk about Future State, and I was on theirs to talk Future State, and we talked about the next Batman and uh, written by John Ridley, who is obviously extremely talented. I just, and this is a Batman sensibility, I don't care if it's not Bruce Wayne. I, I just really don't care. It always feels kind of like a gimmick to me. Uh, the only time I could care is if it's Dick Grayson, because that just feels right. Um, but yeah, I read those Future State issues, and I didn't, I didn't care. I haven't dove into the I Am Batman uh, or there is the next Batman, Second Son, and then I think I Am Batman is about to launch or just launched, and I'm just not, I don't care. So I wish I could tell you, hang in there. It's going to get better. I don't think it does. Nothing's going to happen that's really going to win you over. The whole, it was only four issues, and I don't want to spoil yeah. anything, because I don't know where you're at with that. But it just seemed, seemed like it served as, uh, hey, make sure to come read this new series starring this guy as Batman when we launch it. Mm -hmm. It was just uh, uh, whatever. That's, <laughs> that's how it feels so far to me too. Okay. And, and you and I talked about this in the gates of Gotham episode. If it's not Bruce Wayne, I prefer Dick Grayson. And outside of that, I'm not really interested. I'm, I'm yep. like you. So uh, yeah, it's a tough sell, but I am excited to get into the, uh, the, the detective was, is yes. it dark detective, dark detective. That, yeah. that one is pretty awesome. So Leave it to Bruce Wayne to put your faith back in a Batman story, right? Yeah, that's what I'm looking forward to. <laughs> Always. Well, excellent. Uh, speaking of Bruce Wayne, he does suit up. In today's story that we're going to talk about, Batman the Dark Prince Charming, written and illustrated slash painted by Italian artist Enrico Marini. It was released in two oversized hardcover books in 2017 and 2018. Uh, it was, was then collected later at toward the end of 2018 in a hardcover that collected both volumes. Uh, it, I think last, I don't know if it was this year or last year, uh, semi-recently, let's say that, was released in a trade paperback. It's on DC Universe Infinite and as well as my favorite, Hoopla! Uh, Eric, which version do you did you have to read for this episode? So I have the collected hardcover. Mm-hmm which is what I read. It's a gigantic, beautiful book. It's uh, it's the exact same height as my absolutes. Oh, okay. So, so that's what I wondered if it was then, if it was more oversized than the, the two versions that were first released. Yes. So originally I bought the first one. Uh huh. And um, when the second one came out, I didn't buy the second one. I just bought the oversize. Gotcha. And I think I, I think I, sold the first copy back to the comic shop or something like that. Okay. But anyway, yeah, I, I really love the, the big oversized version. Like I said, it's the same size height wise as an absolute and it fits nicely on my absolute shelf. So fantastic. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I think I just kind of gave it away, answered it myself that I have the two hardcover versions that were released um that were first released they ran at 13 dollars each so it probably was a little bit of a turnoff for a lot of people but also this was kind of under the radar uh, mm -hmm. basically for me i constantly am checking to see of what new batman content is coming each week and when it's when it's a collected story something like this i'm an i'm an instant buy for sure uh do you remember when you first read this um, I read the first one as soon as it, uh, I read them as soon as they came out. Okay. Uh, this was day one purchase at the comic shop. Um, I don't remember. It's been a while. I don't remember if they came out like on a comic book Wednesday or if it was just because, because it's a little bit of a different type of comic. So, um, yeah. but I, I just remember going into my, my local shop and the first, the first one was sitting there and it, it really struck me with the, because the art is is a lot different so i it was it was an immediate purchase for me just out of curiosity absolutely uh i read it i wrote my reviews for batman on film for this um so i was at the comic shop i think they were released on 
um, Wednesdays. Back in the old Wednesday release era. Um, <laughs> Hashtag <we're>, DC Tuesday. <laughs> um, yeah, I read them. I read it right away. And both of them were somewhat like they're they're good, somewhat simple reads, too. So I think I, I blasted through it. And as soon as I got home with it and then I read it a few times um, before volume two came out or part two came out. Uh, and lastly, when I asked you if you'd like to return to the show, you enthusiastically, like I couldn't calm you down. You said, yes, Ryan, please. Uh, and I asked which story you'd like to talk about. And you said the Dark Prince Charming. So what was it? What's the reasoning? Why did you choose the Dark Prince Charming? So and I went a little off script with script with my last episode with White Knight, because that's very much in the public zeitgeist. But mm-hmm. I like I like to bring attention to stories that. I think fly under the radar. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's that's why I chose Gates of Gotham for my first episode because I very much think that's the case there. And absolutely, with this book, I think this book flies under the radar. Um, I think it's a very obscure, lesser known Batman book, mm-hmm. um, and it's not even that old. But I, I just don't think enough people have have read it or enjoyed it. And I agree with you. I think the the purchase price kind of turned people off from the beginning. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's just one of those I'd like to bring a little more attention to because I think it's a, it's a Batman story worthy of, of everyone's time. I fully agree. I like it when that is done as well. Uh, I'm not going to wait until the end. Uh, I'm really glad that you chose this book. I really like this story and now it's definitely in the, the two collected versions of the hardcover or the trade paperback. It's that I'm uh, much more appealing price for for people that if they want to just take a chance on it, it seems much more reasonable to roll the dice on sixteen dollars rather than two thirteen dollar books. Mm-hmm. Uh, and like we said, it's it's on DC Universe and it's on Hoopla, so you can check it out before you buy it. But um, yeah, we're gonna dive into this into this bad boy. It's um, oh, and I will just say real quick, Ryan, uh, mm-hmm. if if you. If you're looking for this book, I, you said the trade's out, but I just looked on eBay today and you can get this exact same absolute size hardcover for pretty cheap on eBay. All right. So, so you're yeah. telling me I have to double dip. I mean, I don't think I have to wrench your arms to double Bold. dip. Right <laughs> Do it right now. By the end of this episode, I'll be like, Hey, Eric, it's supposed to arrive next Thursday. Okay, great. <laughs> um, excellent. So, this is so what I love about this Dark Prince Charming is that this is not an Elseworld story. It can take place uh, roughly, you know, like almost a decade into Batman's career. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, and there's there's a lot of Batman in his prime stories that just that are great and you can make them fit your timeline of events or just let it stand out on its own. It's not forcing certain aspects of or like a different gotham or different iterations it's got batman it's got catwoman it's got joker it's got harley quinn uh it's got jim gordon and all of them are pretty much the characters you know them as so i think that's a big strength for the book of it's somewhat of a recognizable world that you're thrown into but basically batman or bruce wayne uh gets the setup for the story In case anyone is not familiar, a woman with her daughter shows up at Wayne Manor and tells Bruce that she is coming after him because uh, her daughter is Bruce's daughter and she's coming for a big paycheck. As is the way in Gotham City, the Joker finds a way to get involved in everything and somehow gets himself involved with kidnapping this child and Bruce feels then guilty and is now trying to he gets himself involved in the sense of the Joker tracks him down and gets Bruce involved and by that gets Batman involved all circles together <sighs> but it's actually not that difficult of a story to follow <laughs> you know <laughs> no it's it's actually a pretty easy uh easy read it's a really fun um kind of kind of a I'm going to say this and I'll probably say it several times over the episode. It reminds me of Batman, the animated series. All right. Um, How how so? 
because it seems like a story you can just, like you said, you can just dive into. You don't have to read a story before or after it. Um, it seems like a really good two-part episode of the animated series mm -hmm. with all of your favorite characters, especially with the Joker and Harley element. I think Joker and Harley especially reminded me of the of the B Taz relationship. Um, so yeah, uh, I I think it's a really I don't want to say simple because that seems kind of derogatory. Yeah, but it's it's a really straightforward, fun Batman story. Absolutely, and. Marini does a great job of the opening of the book is very threatening because you have Joker coming down basically in you almost think it's like a dungeon and you get mm. you get the hint he has kidnapped a child and uh, then we shoot to Wayne Manor where Bruce gets a box in Joker colors and he says to himself so he's still alive, he's still out there, and he knows. So Marini does a great job setting that up to make you think, oh, uh, Joker knows that I'm Batman. Mm -hmm. Then the story, we really start to discover what the story is about. And Marini, by the end of book one, really has you believing one thing and what all this is leading to. And then the second half of the book flips all of that. And I think that that was really well done. And spoiler. Oh, no, no, no. Let's just let's talk a little bit more about the story. And then we can we can talk about like the end and such. So uh, I guess as well as you can remember. So this whole subplot of a woman named Mariah coming to Wayne Manor and accusing accusing Bruce basically of being the mother or the father of her child. And uh, she's coming after him for a, a shit ton of money for back child support and everything that becomes a big media frenzy. I wasn't excited at that aspect of the story. When I um, first read it, you know, it's like, eh. so okay. it's not the same situation, but it's like a woman manipulating Bruce Wayne uh, for his money. It kind of reminded me of the story. Is it is it in Haunted Night? Yeah, where the where the woman is trying to she's she's a multiple time widow and she's got several uh, shame uh, on me that I can't remember her name. I can't either. <laughs> but yeah, somebody coming after Bruce Wayne's money through uh, through means like this kind of reminded me of that. But I think over the course of the story, by the time you get to the end, um, there's a little more heart in it than there was there. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Yeah. So especially when you find out the whole situation with the little girl. Yeah. And I, I think that's where, as the story definitely developed, he at first, just at the surface level, I was kind of like, eh, but then you feel, you realize like how integral to the plot. And that's just the, that's just the jumping off point. That's to really get things going. And then how that. Uh, evolves and makes the story evolve definitely ends up it, it reflects better you know when I when I went back um, that was just first reading and then every time after that because I knew where it went it was like oh okay yeah this is a story beat that makes that makes total sense but mm -hmm. there's this whole questioning of um, is Bruce you know like I'm, I'm glad there wasn't a Maury Povich segment of is Bruce the father <laughs> But it, it makes you wonder. And because we're, I don't know, we are stubborn as our, the Batman fans that we are, that's just not normal for the, like that, we don't have that, um, I don't want to say, that's too different to where we don't, no, 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 that's just not true. That's not Bruce's daughter. That just didn't happen. It can't happen. And Marini does it, a good, go ahead. It seems like Bruce wouldn't. It, it, our Batman, I, yeah. I know what you, I know what you mean. Like our Batman yes. wouldn't lose control like that. You know, everything, yeah. <laughs> everything in his life is so structured and it, he, he wouldn't let that happen. He wouldn't let it happen. He would accept responsibility of being a parent. Like that's just, he's not a scumball. Um, mm -hmm. But Marini takes us, you know, takes us on this journey that even as there are DNA results, um, because while well, the Joker factors in, and that he gets catches wave of this, uh, 
media frenzy and he wants to get Harley. And this is a perfect Joker uh, plot. He wants to get Harley a good birthday present. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be a very rare, extremely expensive diamond going up for auction. So Joker decides, you know what? I should kidnap this child and make Bruce Wayne pay for the ransom by getting me this diamond so I can give it to Harley. It's so weird, but it's also so in line for the character of the Joker that it totally works. So he crashes while Mariah and her daughter, Alina, are in a uh, the backseat of their lawyer's car. Joker, they get in a car crash. Joker steals or takes Alina. Her blood's around. Bruce takes, as Batman, takes a DNA sample. And it's cleverly shown and revealed that we don't see the screen of the DNA results, we see Bruce's reaction to it Mm -hmm. again, leading us to like, Oh, maybe, huh? Maybe this, this is true. And then at the end of book one, there is a flashback to nine years ago where Mariah worked as a bartender and Bruce came into her bar and she served him and wanted to meet up after he, after she closed. So all of that front part is leading toward, you know, we're definitely thinking that maybe this is actually it. And that's that's true for this story. And, and that's something uh, when we get to the end of the story, mm-hmm. I want to come back to and, and ask you your opinion on something. But I'm not okay. quite there yet because we're not to the end of the story. Okay. But yeah, it is it is fascinating because it it makes you doubt for for a minute when you get to the end of book one. You're like, well, did did Bruce mess up? Did yeah. he have a I mean, he is human after all. He is. Mm-hmm the most human of all the superheroes. So he, you know, maybe he did have a moment of weakness. It, it, it puts a little seed of doubt in there, which I think makes it a more fascinating story. Even if it's like, it, as a Batman fan, you're like, ah, I don't know if I like that. It makes it intriguing. Exactly. And that's, what's really funny too. So after I know what I just said, uh, I do like my Batman being perfect. I like my Bruce being perfect. Um, but then I like just as much stories where like he's just effing up a lot too, you know? And, mm-hmm. and I actually talked about that the last episode, but damned of it's a story where Bruce is powerless. Um, he's just making like, he's outmatched. He does. He doesn't have plans. And it's, it's kind of a fascinating story because, you know, it's like, man, what is, if Batman doesn't have a plan for this, how is he going to get out of this? And so on a much, uh, smaller scale here uh that's that's a little bit of questioning is that the kind of bruce that we have in this story and man that is that's that's interesting and then as the as the joker continues to spin his web you know it's kind of like man bruce you're caught you're caught in that spider web how are you going to get untangled how are you going to cut yourself loose and uh i think that's a a great strength for i was really unfamiliar with marina's work i still still kind of am even though i follow him on twitter and instagram like i just know when he puts out new art and stuff and look at it and it always looks great Mm -hmm. but it's like man if this is i need to just see what your other work is because to come out of the out of the gate here with a batman story which i think this is his first one this is a great and like that that plot and as we just keep talking about the plot and how kind of intricately detailed it is and how it's building you know and evolving i think that's just it's really, really well done for a, you know, first time Batman story. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, I have read one other book of his, uh, okay. Lay Lay Scorpion. It's, um, it's, it's a little difficult to explain because everything he writes is translated. Yeah. Um, so even this book, he, he didn't write it in English. It was trans translated by uh, dark guard who's the company that puts out the American versions. Okay. Um, but Lay Scorpion is kind of a, it's like a 18th century story. Okay. Um, so yeah, I, I have read some of his other work. I don't know that I don't like it as much as the Batman stuff, to be okay. honest with you. Uh, this is the only thing I've ever read from him that really hooked me. I guess, but his art, I mean, his art is what gets you first. For sure. It's right, so, I, it's so well done. It's, it's a painted style mm-hmm. and like 
first and foremost. And I think that will always stand out because we're, we're just not used to that much, you know, painted artwork in a full comic book story. Mm -hmm. And so it's, he just creates, you know, it's a back and forth between a blue and like a, uh, I mean, not gold, but, um, well, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of red skies as well, which also I said it earlier, it, it gives me that, um, the animated series vibe when you see the, the yeah. red skies and Batman just diving across the, the rooftops and things like that. So yeah, I do get that animated series vibe from some of it. And I'm sorry, I derailed the story to talk about the art. <laughs> no, it's, I mean, we, I think we have to talk about the art because it, it just looks great. It's very, it's very cinematic. It very, it stands out on its own. It's, you know, it's got pieces that are moody, which I mm -hmm. love that as a setting and as an atmosphere for a Batman story. And I, I so this, the cityscape I think looks great. Uh, I love his Batman design. Yeah. So for me, it's kind of a cross between um, the Arkham Batman and the Nolan Batman. Okay. That's, that's what I get when I look at Marini's Batman. Because you've got like the separated plates and things like that. I mean, you can tell his suit is very armor-based. Yeah. I think it actually, and now looking at it a little bit, um, there are certain aspects of it that I see in Pattinson's suit. I know we've seen very little, mm -hmm. but I, I do think that there is a little bit of it that looks um, more so along like the arms and the chest. And I know that that's getting very nerdy and nit, like nit, not nitpicky, but uh, specific. Mm -hmm. But I see a little bit of that, but definitely the Arkham, like you'd said, I think um, reflects and I think really well. uh, the Batmobile the makes me think a little bit Arkham Knight Batmobile too. Yeah, that's the I would say if I have a nitpick, that's the only that's, that's oh, the one okay? big. I am not crazy about this Batmobile. Uh, it looks like a, a bug to me. How dare you? <laughs> I'm sorry. It's got all these little <laughs> like it looks like antenna, like a bug, like okay. hanging off of it. I, I'm not crazy about it, but that's one minor nitpick of of a lot of art that I really enjoy. In There's the something book. about the in, the interior seems a little classic too, of like the square, the square monitor of when he's uh, tuning into different things and talking to Alfred mm -hmm. and stuff. I feel like that seems very. You know, that seems uh, Batman Returns, um, I thought of. And I think I think that was in, did he have a square monitor in the Batmobile in the animated series? I don't know. Oof. You're, you're testing my fandom it's, here. It seemed like, oh, yeah, definitely. He's got a square monitor in the Batmobile because that's what's always there. And then you're like, I know mm -hmm. it is. But then also versions, it's not. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But it, it just, to me, it felt right. But um Respect. Respect that you don't like it. It's okay. Uh, yeah, it's just not my favorite. <laughs> it's all good. Yeah. The I joke. Love, I love the suit in the cave, though. Yeah. I the the armored aspect of it. It does. It does work, and there's always such a debate between. Should we see the eyes or not through the cowl? Mm -hmm. And I'm one that I think it's very effective in comics to not see the eyes and in live action to see the eyes. But actually here at times that it is close up, we do see the eyes and I think it looks good. Well, and that, and that's what I like about the way that Marini did it here is because you rarely see his eyes. Mm. Most of the time when you see Batman in the story, his face is shadowed. Yeah. So you, you get like, you get like the, you get the outlines of the eyebrows, mm -hmm. but you really don't see the eyes un until they get really close. Yeah. It's really close shot. And I, and I think it's effective when you see the close up shots of his eyes. Yeah. Yep. Definitely. Uh, Joker. The Joker design is what I thought of. I thought of this Marini's version. Definitely when the first images of Joaquin Phoenix's Joker was, was released. I have not 
come across anything that is confirmed or denied it. Um, just to me, I instantly thought, and I think it's because of the the stripes going across the eyes. The I think that got, really yeah. stood out to me. Yeah. Um, but other than that, the the Joker's design is uh it's cool. It's not my favorite. It's definitely not my least favorite though, either. No, I I think it's I think it's definitely a Joker design that works very well for this story. Mm-hmm. Sure. Um it's got a very I mean it's a very stylized version of the Joker. Mm-hmm. And, and I, it's not my favorite either, but it works really well here. Also, I mean, Harley's not my favorite version either. No. And uh, the U S is the only country that makes a big deal out of um, <laughs> shapes of males and females in mm-hmm. art <laughs> because especially Ask Lee exactly. Ask Lieber Mayho. It, in Italy and in Europe, it is not a big deal. Uh, so I'm not surprised that Marini drew a more revealing Harley. But also, I I think some people would maybe be a little surprised by how she would look. Um, to me, I could see the character and still say, oh, yeah, that's Harley Quinn. Did you feel the same way or do you think she's maybe too different to be instantly recognizable well i think you have to look at the time that this book came out Mm -hmm. um because the current harley that everyone knew from this time was margot robbie's harley from suicide squad which had just come out the year before um which you know we had harley in the little booty shorts that was very revealing so um yeah, I, I think you just have to look at the at the timetable. And also, as you said, I mean, he's Marini's Italian and mm-hmm. they don't get as worked up about the human form as 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 we yeah. uh, overly sensitive Americans do sometimes. <laughs> so, um, yeah, while it's not um, my favorite depiction of Harley, it's also not something I'm, I'm not going to get up in arms about it either. Um, I don't con- I don't really consider myself a prude. No. Uh, so yeah, it, it's not offensive or anything. I don't think. No. And I think it, it fits, it fits for this story. I think the characterization of Harley in this is definitely indicative and reflective of, uh, the animated series for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I like Catwoman. I, I don't think that, um, I was gonna say, I don't think she's three dimensional, but I don't mean that as an insult and, this isn't a Catwoman Selena Kyle story. It's, I think it is what you know Catwoman and Selena to be. That's what mm. she is in the story. And there's kind of not much else other than that. And I think it totally works for this story too, because I think she's she's pretty awesome. <laughs> she in the story she, definitely. She's a vehicle to move the plot along. Yeah, in this story, um, with the you know she's. She is typical classical Catwoman. She's the she's the thief that wants the chase with Batman, and yeah. that that's just used as as a little, like I said, a little vehicle to to move the story along. And I, I as a lot of us Batman fans like, we want her and Bruce to end up together. And in this story, they they are together. So it's kind of like, <laughs> that's where uh, that's how when people say that, like comic books are like us nerds are soap operas i fully agree in that regard it's like oh yay helena and bruce have a get there again <laughs> <laughs> no, hooray i'm so happy now <laughs> well and as someone who I, I i am ready for a little of of a break on that to be honest with you because i i you know this. You're not, not a King tr- fan. <laughs> not trying to start any fights. Two but... strikes, Eric Carter. <laughs> Your third yeah. and last time on the Batman book club. <laughs> well, it was good while it was. <laughs> it was fun, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I not that I love Selena and Bruce together, but I've I've got a little um I've got, gotten a little I don't know, it's it's overexposed a little bit for me recently. Mm-hmm. I get um, that. So it was nice actually to read this story where it's, it's part of the story, but it's not in your face constant, you know? Yeah. Yeah. 
I'm with you. Uh, I think that that pretty much does. I mean, we get we get little bits of Alfred. We get very little bits of uh, Gordon. We meet one of Joker's henchmen, Archie, who is the most cynical um, Joker henchman I think we've ever run into in any medium. And he's actually a little bit of a hoot. <laughs> oh, he is morbidly hilarious. It's... And it's it's funny that Alina sees him and says that he reminds her of Droopy because that is exactly who I would have thought before um before she even said that line like man this is like a mix of droopy and eeyore you know well, yeah you know i tried to jump off a building but you know <laughs> you'll be explaining the many ways that he tried to off himself is I, it's <laughs> it's, it's totally to yeah it's dark humor for sure mm-hmm. but um i mean it's also just just kind of funny and i'm trying to see if i can the first time i saw him Name's Archie and life sucks. So what do I care? Because yeah, because Joker just kills all of his henchmen and then he runs out of bullets when he gets to Archie and he's like, you know, what's up with you, Shorty? You don't even flinch. Name's Archie and life sucks. So what do I care? (laughs) (laughs) And that's just all of it. (laughs) And now thanks to you, Ryan, anytime I read this story in the future, I'm going to read Archie's lines in Eeyore's voice. In Eeyore's voice. (laughs) (laughs) There's no crew anymore, boss. My name is... (laughs) And that, that's this, like, this it's, is bad. It's, a, it's not overly PC in how Joker definitely is very condescending and calls him something different and insulting every time. He calls every time he refers to him. But it's funny in the sense how Archie, every single time, he's like, name's still Archie, boss. Nope, my name's still Archie. You can still <laughs> not call my name. me Archie. That's not my name. Yeah, I <laughs> like that's just a fun, that's a funny gag that goes throughout the story that I that I enjoy. So, I mean, Archie's, yeah. a, Archie's a winner here. Well, well done. And you kind of have an affection for Archie by the end you of do. the story. Yeah, and it, spoiler alert, I'm glad that he makes it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I'm, I'm glad about that. Uh, which I, he's not your typical joker henchman so i didn't figure he was gonna he was gonna go but you know i hope that they somehow incorporate him into into something i don't know um that had been funny it's the new and improved gaggy the much more tolerable gaggy oh very uh, much more tolerable. <laughs> uh we do also i almost forgot to mention that we do get a killer croc who kind of reminds me of the uh, Azarello and Bermeo's Jokers. Uh, yeah, the more gangster Killer Croc. Yeah. And uh, I mean, he's very, very brief in the story, but he's cool. I think mm-hmm. um, it's a good little fight between him and Batman. And then he's also creepy. He's got the split, the split tongue, but then Batman just beats his ass as Batman should. So that's a that's a cool fight. I like so that. I think you may have answered this before, Ryan. But <gasps> I'm curious. I can't remember. Um do you prefer the the gangster style Killer Croc, or do you prefer the, the straight up monster Croc? I like the monster. Okay. I yeah, I feel like most stories of Killer Croc are one or the other, and so I just don't know much what you can do with with Killer Croc. I think you can do more. You can probably do more with him as a gangster. Uh, then you can as him as a monster in the sewers. And so I was actually, I hadn't read much, but when he was part of the suicide squad, it made me think like, Oh, okay, good. That's giving killer. It's keeping killer croc relevant and giving him something mm-hmm. to do. Um, but I, I really liked though, because it kind of haunted me in the nineties with nightfall when the uh, killer croc would pop up. Mm-hmm. And then when his fight with Bane and stuff, there was something about that art and everything that really creeped me out as a kid. And I just thought that was almost the most effective. That was my favorite killer croc. And the, just capitalizing on the whole, you know, there's alligators in the sewers and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And I, I think just as like, almost as a horror fan, I really like that kind of aspect to a uh, killer croc. Yeah. And the I, Arkham Asylum game. Like, yeah. I was going to bring that up. That's the first time that croc really scared me <laughs> was mm-hmm. playing the Arkham game. Playing that at night, time. really loud yeah. and dark. Oof. Yeah, oh, creepy goodness. vibes. Yeah, but I I think it's a good blend in this story because he mm-hmm. is the gangster, but he's got the I don't know more of the monster features and things like that. So I I, I like the the little blend that Marini did here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 
big fan and it ends as it should mm-hmm. With, that yeah. man whooping his ass <laughs> uh let's see let's hit up on some other parts here so the whole diamond aspect of it i mean the blue cat the blue cats yes very rare um it's going at an auction for like 58 million dollars like these people make me sick that they can just spend that kind that they have that kind of money that they can just spend um at an auction on a damn diamond (laughs) but um i like the twist in that of you go into bruce the demands of the joker is that bruce needs to show up at that auction and he needs to win the diamond and then Mm -hmm. he needs to take that to joker in exchange for alina the girl so you think bruce is going to just go and offer the the money and get it but it becomes a bidding war selena's there bidding for it as well and he's going up against somebody else who just keeps raising the price raising the price and bruce just stops uh bidding and then you realize like oh hell the the auction's over and bruce didn't get it huh and then all hell breaks loose because selena decides she needs to steal it and then it's on the news too because i didn't know that they put auctions live on the news but uh joker panics about it and i i like that we're entering now the basically the final act of the story and it's it's definitely unpredictable of well shit like Batman was supposed to get this diamond to give to Joker in exchange for the girl, but neither of them have it. Catwoman's right. got it. Ah, oh, hell. <laughs> like, I, it's just another fun, and I mean, it leads to another Batman Catwoman chase in which Bruce or Batman ultimately gets it. But I mean, those are some great pages too, especially in, when you. You know, it's been revealed at this point that they know who each other are, and yet this is still going down. But yet they're still kind of an item, and I'm—it's such a great kind of just like juggling, you know, of characters and storylines and stuff. So yeah, that was one part that caused just a little confusion for me um, in the story because they make it very clear that Selena and Bruce are kind or pretty much together. Yeah, um, and then you know her competing with him at the auction is a little perplexing to me mm-hmm. and then her straight up stealing the diamond it's like why were you bidding if you were just going to steal it anyway i don't know that that part was just a, a little confusing for me um but also I, i'm wondering does she know why he wants the diamond is this just part of the the game that she's playing with him you know uh, is it is she trying to just have the normal batman Catwoman, cat and mouse game or you know what's going on there it's 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 not really clear well i thought it was hinted at um or it was even mentioned at some point earlier in the story that she was kind of jealous slash pissed off that bruce could have a child and that he didn't tell her right but and that's i think that's where i get a a little perplexed because i'm like well even if that's the case is is selena that i don't know immature that, uh, je- that jealousy would cause that yeah i don't know about the jealousy part as opposed to the fact of we're an item you never told me right that you have a child that's i mean that's a pretty big well hell he revelation didn't yeah right? exactly <laughs> <laughs> those were my wild days there selena um <laughs> uh, not my bruce hashtag not my bruce um i and, i get that not saying I, not saying that it's 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 something that brings the story to a halt or anything like that. I mean, obviously I still wanted to talk about the story. Exactly. I enjoy it, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's just a, it's just a little slight nitpick. Gotcha. I mean, it's, I... it's not the clearest of, um, of transitions, I guess. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, trying to think here. Where's that last part? Okay. So he gets the jewels. So, see, I've got you confused too, Ryan. You do. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, damn you. <laughs> Back on track. Uh, the Batman or Bruce Batman, they, he is able to track down 
where the Joker is hiding out. Mm-hmm. Uh, doesn't have the gem, but still, thanks to Catwoman and Alina. Alina's a little badass. She and, is. Uh, the Joker puts a gun up to the face of jo- of uh, Harley, and he pulls the trigger, but Catwoman saves her. But Catwoman, she does it to take her her diamond back. Um, but Alina, it's it's great and how ultimately in the end she saves Batman. And then by poisoning Joker and then throwing the antidote, mm-hmm. which makes causes Joker to jump out of a window in classic Joker fashion, you like mm-hmm. you're I don't know, did he live or did he die? But oh, we we all know the answer to that. Yeah, so. of course. But then that kind of takes so that's where then at the end it becomes it comes full circle. And you realize, oh, this is here's Bruce sitting at his desk with the Joker box. Mm-hmm. Brings and, us back to the beginning. It, exactly. It brings us back to the beginning and you open it. And then you see, kiss my, like, there's a note in there, kiss my little princess for me. And Bruce has adopted Alina at this point. And then we get the flashback, basically almost exactly like the Bruce flashback, except it's Joker. It's ultimately revealed at Joker into then you're pretty much led to believe that that's Joker's daughter. Right. Well, bum, bum, bum. And not the new 52 Joker's daughter. No, no, no. no. This is a different one. A this better is much, Joker's much better Joker's <laughs> daughter. <laughs> Which I think is a, is, is a question in itself because it never shows us uh, through the story like the actual results of the DNA test. Exactly. But it shows us these two kind of flashbacks of one Bruce going to this bar Mm -hmm. and then Joker going to this bar. Mm -hmm. So I think it leaves you in a, you know, go the direction you want to go with it. Yeah. Because, and that's, that's what he did really smart is that Marini gave you all evidence and is just letting you, what do you believe? Mm -hmm. Uh, You've got both men in the same place interacting with the same woman in the same time period Mm -hmm. and then the dna results we don't know why bruce and alfred were surprised i led i'm led to believe that it's jokers yes joker said my little princess Mm -hmm. um mariah i mean it does she doesn't get as full-on specific evidence on why she believes it's bruce and it has to be bruce and it's only bruce um so, I mean, yeah, it's kind of left open, but I ultimately in the end believe for this story that it was Joker. What did you, where did you go with it? I, because of the, of the purple um, birthmark uh-huh. that Alina has on her face, it tends to, it leads me to believe it's Joker's daughter. Gotcha. Um, okay. And, I, and for what reason, other than the color purple, I don't know, maybe something to do with the with ace chemicals and all that um but yeah i i like it better if it's joker's daughter because that that then tells me that yes bruce is the is the moral high ground and he is the the person that wouldn't make that mistake so yeah i think that's another one too is just out of pure preference for Mm -hmm. me is just like no i don't want to believe that bruce is the is the father so oh good you have evidence that it's it could be someone else well then it's somebody else yeah (laughs) thank you thank the lord oh my goodness um i i like the the capper you thought the story is um was over and then you go to the last one and it's so random of just a selfie between harley and archie (laughs) and then a little writing oh Archie. Yeah. it's so out like where was this what was this who was he writing to where did they find this but also i don't care because it's more of archie uh, i like uh i like the idea of uh harley and archie as the new yeah. <laughs> uh, quote unquote king and queen of god <laughs> harley and archie coming this fall on abc um it does seem like kind of an odd couple kind of that would be great. Oh yeah, Harley. Yeah, because you do. You'd have Harley, who's all, 
you know, boisterous and woo. And, and then you have the or. Archie or <laughs> not my name. Still Archie. It's a good man. That Archie. Uh, I mean, are there any other story beats here that you, that you want to bring up that we missed? I mean, there's a lot that we could dive into, um, but it is a, it's, it's not a very long or, or necessarily intensely deep story, but there are a little, a lot of little moments. I, I like the little moments of Joker with the different uh, gangs that he has, and mm-hmm. neither of them are, are adequate for him, uh, which is classic Joker. He's not, he's definitely not as scary of a Joker, which is, I mean, it's funny. He kidnapped a child and is keeping her in a boiler room, but well, it's, it, it's he's not more as of that, scary of a Joker as we've seen in other stuff. It's more of a, of a whimsical mm-hmm. animated series type Joker. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I do really like the moments between Joker and Alina though. Yeah, that's good. Um, that's good dialogue. The, I mean, it's not to, I like the cross-dressing Joker meet up with Bruce scene because of what's at stake. And that's a total character. It's just like a small character scene of dialogue back and forth. And then the threat is there and how he's got the phone that has Archie holding the gun up to Alina's head, which is always mm-hmm. like a, holy shit kind of image you know and then bruce grabs him by the throat and it's great of um bruce grabs joker by the throat there and then he gets grabbed by the throat by batman later and it's like oh that's a familiar yeah i know that or something yeah i know that grip there you go yeah and it's kind of like oh that's kind of like that's a nice touch but like that that diner scene of the two sometimes i i do and be like just bet- between Batman and Joker, and in this case, Bruce and Joker, those can just be really good, just dialogue scenes, you know, mm-hmm. different ideologies and such matching one on one. I really appreciate those kind of scenes and stuff. Well, not to mention that the cross cross dressing Joker kind of gives you the it, it, it reminds me of Heath Ledger's Joker in, in the hospital dressed the nurse, as the nurse, nurse Joker. Also, yeah. my Halloween outfit in 2008. No big deal. Oh. Yeah, I got to find those pictures. And put I was about to say, I tell are people there pictures? About it. Oh, yeah, definitely. I was pretty proud of it. It looked pretty good. <laughs> I even I even got on eBay, and I believe in Harvey Dent, um, like a sticker that I put on there, too, and it was Jokerized. It was really cool. I admire the continuity. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, I think that's that's all I got for the story here. You want to start dipping into some favorites? Yeah, let's do it. Well, then why don't you start us off? Do you have a favorite part of the Dark Prince Charming? Yeah, so it's it's right there at the end. Um, after after well, Alina has saved Batman, really. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're and they're together. I like the entire ending of of batman even though he knows uh well i like to feel that he knows that this is not his his daughter but he takes it upon himself to to adopt this girl and to take take care of her that's that's the kind of bruce wayne that that we really aspire to right yeah so yeah this this whole ending of him just just giving because we didn't even mention the batman doll but she she really she loves batman Mm-hmm. So she had she has this little Batman doll throughout the story, and at the beginning he notices that the the symbol has been ripped off of the chest. So at the end, when he adopts her, he has Alfred fix the. He gives her the the little Batman doll back, and Alfred has fixed it. It's got the symbol on it and everything. And I I really just like the ending with Bruce and and Alina here. I like it there in that warehouse of Batman holding her hand and looking down mm-hmm. at her, and then it's the same exact image in the hospital where it's bruce holding her hand too i think that was done really well yeah that's great Mm -hmm. yeah uh good part i'm i'm even a little bit more just simplistic though i think i really like the the first action scene the big chase because we have the ground level of of stuff and then you turn the page 
and Batman's on a gargoyle. Oh my God, can be Batman on a gargoyle any day. <laughs> Overlooking, and that's like our first kind of like cityscape shot by Marini, which looks great. Oh, that's and, beautiful. And then we're yeah. down seeing all the action, and then it's like, oh hell, Catwoman's here too, which looks great. It's like, how is she involved in this? And then um Batman jumping off and flying down, and then he lands on top of the van. And I just really like that whole action sequence. And it's kind of a long one too. Yeah, it's very cinematic. It's like mm-hmm. a Batman movie starting with a big action scene and getting and, and then getting into the story. Yep. I really like yeah. that one. That's very yeah, good. I'm with you. I like that. Uh, and then a, in a a book that is a lot of gorgeous art, do you have a favorite panel? Uh yes, it actually comes from Oh thank from... goodness. <laughs> it actually comes from that same sequence you were just talking about. Ooh. Uh, it's on, it's, it's after like the whole chase has ended, they're on the bridge and you have that panel of wow. uh, all of the Joker crooks looking over the edge of the bridge and you've got Batman descending behind them. It just yeah. reminds me of Michael Keaton so much. I love that panel. Good call. Yeah. Keaton. Yeah, it just gives me that vibe that, that yeah, he's he's about to kick every one of their asses. <laughs> I really like that panel. And, you know, I always say on the show, of give me what my favorite stuff is always. Give me one image, no context. And if I can wrap a story around it, and that definitely right there, because you just see like, oh, these are Joker goons. Mm-hmm. And here comes Batman to just, just take them out. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot. Oh, this one's This one's hard. There's a lot of really good images of, like Batman around Gotham are just some of my favorites. And then when he comes crashing down on Killer Croc, um, I love, I really love that image. Um, oh yeah. That's a great one. But I think, I mean, it's tough, but I really think that my favorite is when he's in the Batcave, cave uh, sitting at the, at his computer, his computer. Well, he's standing and Alfred's actually at the monitor. Mm-hmm. I think I just really love that because I mean it's a freaking bat cave shot. I think it just looks it just looks damn good. I really yeah, love that's, that. That's the shot I was looking at earlier when I said I really like the suit and the cave. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's a that's a great image. And there's so I mean this there's this so book many. is beautiful. So mm-hmm. yeah, there's so yeah, many. There's and so that's many what I, I think going into this, um, I had it of that that him crashing through the window with killer croc and then during our discussion i've been flipping through you know and i saw that again i just kept going back to that i'm like actually i think this one might be my favorite but ask me tomorrow and it'll be another one i'm sure well yeah because i mean if you flip it two pages from that uh bat cave scene there's that there's that one big page of batman just swinging over the city you've got all the buildings in the background yes. batman in the center of the page yeah there's so many shots like that in this book that are just beautiful to look at yeah Get this guy on more Batman. I'm just saying. Uh, I agree. Like, would you like to see this adapted in animation? Uh, yeah, I think I think this would. And this art specifically, no, I don't. I don't know that you could necessarily pull this off verbatim. Hmm. But I'd love to see Paul Dini and Bruce Tim get a hold of this. Uh, and and because. Uh, the Batman Harley Quinn movie wasn't my favorite, Ugh. but I, I love Bruce Tim working on Batman. And I think him and Paul Dini could do a great job with, with a movie, an animated film based on this. I think so. I think so too. Uh, it would be, I mean, the, the tone would be quite the line to toe here because as you just brought up the Batman and Harley Quinn uh, I watched that once and I did not like it, period. And mm-hmm. I'm almost because I think it's on HBO Max right now. I really want to just give it another shot and not for the sense of I don't think I'm going to totally I, I will never love that movie. Uh, but maybe I just need to watch it a second time to confirm my feelings. <laughs> but this book pending, you know, pending the tone. I mean, it wouldn't take much and it almost could feel a little bit more in line with leaning closer to Batman and Harley Quinn as opposed to a little bit more kind of uh, maybe the animated series. You keep bringing that up. Um, But I would like to see the full story. And I think you could do it because as 
the 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 plot has a lot going on to justify a 70 minute movie mm-hmm. i think so there's enough for them to do and for the story to evolve that i think that th- this wouldn't need to be just like one episode of a cartoon series or have a ton of stuff added i think you can take it as is and right. uh, include it all and so far as the tone i don't think you'd have to do much work to make this fit in the pg pg 13 realm i mean you, oh no you this is pg 13 yeah yeah you, you don't need r for this this is this is a this is a story that even the most extreme there's nothing really extreme Mm-mm. in the story outside of maybe harley's outfit you you could you could put her in a more we've seen worse in pg-13 yeah. movies than harley's outfit so For yeah sure. I, I think we'd be good mm-hmm. um at pg-13 so um there you go I mean, it's waiting for you. It's waiting for you. Make make Marini a consultant. You know, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> make sure that we get Archie in there. <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah, the doing taking over Gotham. But I mean, if we don't get it animated, I'd love to just see Marini do some more Batman work. I I'd love a follow up to this. Mm-hmm. Bring in a. I mean, doesn't have to be Joker anymore. No. Um, bring up. I mean, bring in another. Hell, bring in a. Uh, Oh my God! Imagine his visuals with Scarecrow. Do Ooh. Mad Hatter. Ooh, there you go. You could do Mad Hatter too. Like I don't know. Do any. Just do a freaking sequel. Come on, Marini. I'd be really interested <laughs> to see for them to take the effort of so quickly doing like releasing a hardcover and then releasing a, a trade paperback. I feel like this had to have done pretty good numbers because otherwise, why would they put in the effort and the money to? re-release it you know the only thing that tells me that it did because i don't think this it doesn't seem like this did very well when it first came out um because i know and you know it's hard to tell because you always think about the comic shop that you go to Mm -hmm. and i know copies of this sat on the shelves for a long time so but and, and like i said you can get it fairly uh affordable on ebay so uh, I don't know, but yeah, I I think again, as we said at the beginning, the cover price of books like this kind of turn people off. But I get really interested in this in these premium format books, so I would I would love to see more of this. Yeah, that's not too. I mean, even on Amazon, I'm looking right now, and the deluxe hardcover from Amazon, brand new, is twenty nine dollars. Uh, but you can buy, you know, use the new offer, start at twenty. So. And the paperback yeah. brand new is 16. Uh, so, I mean, if it's somebody affordable. hasn't, if somebody hasn't read it or uh, bought it, I'm sorry. We spoiled it for you, but Hey, it's <laughs> worth it. Hunt it down. Okay. I mean, I know digitals can be very beneficial and nice, but also like I, having a physical I do copy. not recommend digital for this <laughs> because you just think you need a hard cover or you need a, physical copy in your hands to look at it well and even like even for you have you ever have you ever seen the the oversized book uh i have not like opened it and look no but i've seen it at the on the shelves before so as as someone who had this the smaller version the part one Mm -hmm. i wouldn't go back and read it like that oh boy you're really trying to sell me on this aren't you (laughs) i am because i just think you know the the painted style it lends itself much better to these the big oversized pages Mm. and i really can't imagine like reading it on a on a smaller tablet or something like that you're gonna get me in trouble and that and i'm someone who reads digital comics all the time Mm -hmm. so yeah it's just it's just my personal opinion though don't don't let me make you spend money (laughs) ryan (laughs) it doesn't i mean it's like gravity it just takes a push you know, <laughs> uh, on Amazon, I mean, as I just looked that up, though, the trade actually just came out last month. Uh, I didn't even, I didn't even so. realize that. I didn't either. But do yourself a favor, get the hardcover. I mean, or just get it. Yes. But I think the hardcover, I'm a sucker for hardcovers. If I can get something hardcover, that's my preference. Mm-hmm. Um, I but agree. anyway. Uh, so, Mr. Carter, uh, what are your final thoughts on Batman the A Dark Prince Charming before we head out? Um, so it's not, it's, it's not anywhere close to like my favorite Batman story of all time or anything like that. Um, Mm -hmm. but it is one that I think is extremely fun. 
Uh, it's one that I, I revisit uh, every so often. And it's, it's one when I'm, when I'm not looking for like, you know, sometimes you just don't want to read no man's land, you know, you don't have time for that kind of commitment. <laughs> yeah. You know, so it's, it's a story that's, it's got a lot of heart. It's got a lot of, um, fun and adventure that's that really brings you into batman's world and it's got a fun little twist a lot of things in the book i think we were talking about before we started recording i mean i remembered the main plot but there's lots of little details that i forgot and it's just a fun adventure to jump back into and and re revisit and i mean how can you not love archie mm-hmm. <laughs> so, well, nobody else does, so I shouldn't expect you <laughs> <Yeah>. to. Yeah. <laughs> so, but yeah, it's it's a really fun book, and I and if you haven't read it, uh, even if you've listened to this whole episode and listened to us talk about it, I, I just for the art um, that that pairs with this wonderful story, I would recommend picking it up. I'm with you. I I really like this book. I really like this story. Um, it's definitely. I mean. It's not one of my favorites, but that doesn't necessarily need to mean it's not one of my favorites in the sense of like, it's not my top 10. I revealed my top 10 earlier this year, episode 50. Check it out if you haven't already. Or, um, but it's, I just, I've always enjoyed coming back to this one. And uh, it's a pretty uh, time. It's not so timely to, it doesn't take you a ton to get through it. Uh, Mm -hmm. And I mean that in a respectful way, because we all have a lot going on all the time. So uh, you want to read this Batman story. I mean, if you sat down uninterrupted half hour, I mean, not half hour, sorry, uh, an hour to like an hour 15, maybe I think you could read this whole thing and you could take your time with that too. Um, It's and by that, that doesn't mean that it's like, it's not a smart book or anything because it is. Um, it's a smart story and it evolves throughout. And I think it's really well done. And I think Marini does a great job. And of course, his art is fantastic. Uh, yeah, I just I do think it's a really good story. It's definitely worth adding to your library if you don't own it already. And kind of like Eric said, I I understand digital convenience. Uh, sometimes it's very cost effective to be digital with it. But this this is one that a physical copy really... Uh, it's kind of the way to go into really enjoying that art. So um, yeah, Batman Dark Prince Charming, highly recommended if you've check never it read it. Definitely. And if we haven't ruined it enough for you, um, yeah, check it out. And if we did ruin it for you, uh, check it out. Check it out. Okay, there we go. Got it. <laughs> check it out. Uh, Eric Carter, thank you for pulling the hat trick, coming on here for a third time. Um, why don't you tell everybody where they can follow you and this hot new podcast you got going on yeah absolutely um for my personal accounts you can find me on instagram uh vero and twitter at me carter 89 that's m e carter 89 and as for the show uh the fire rises you can find it on apple podcasts um podbean spotify um amazon music and that is uh, our social media is TFR Bat Pod, and that's Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And we also have a T Public store now. So mm-hmm. if you just go to T Public and search TFR Bat Pod, you'll find uh, our logo on all kinds of cool merchandise there. Excellent. Um, yeah, actually wore my shirt yesterday. What? Oh, nice. I didn't even show you that I wore, so there's no proof. But oh, <laughs> oh and go back to our uh review of the comic <gasps> Batman the Long Halloween, and you'll find your your host here, Mr. Ryan Lauer. That was me. Yeah, talking long Halloween, my favorite pastime. I love it. <laughs> uh, it's fantastic. All right, well, follow Eric there, follow his show. If you want to follow the Batman Book Club on Twitter and Instagram, you can at the Batman BC for latest ep- episodes, uh, upcoming episodes, and sometimes even some giveaways. Uh, I also just recently got the Batman Book Club as a channel on YouTube, and I did a quick review of the Batman 89 comic, the first issue of that. So check that out on on youtube if you want to write into the show with questions or comments you can at the batman bc at gmail.com uh, you can help support the show through patreon at patreon.com slash the batman bc or even on t public which like eric just mentioned um some great merchandise there of this hot 
um, logo designed by my pal Justin Kowalski, which, oh my God, Eric, I don't know if you even checked this out. Interviewed part two of The Long Halloween with uh, Bill on Batman on Film and Micro Ramey, who has been on this show before to talk ego. And we interviewed Tim Sheridan, awesome guy, screenwriter for uh, The Long Halloween. We did a Woo-hoo. part two discussion and it's a video. He bought and was wearing a Batman Book Club t shirt. What an endorsement. Uh... How cool is that? Doesn't get much better than that. And what's even funnier is I was wearing one the same day in the same conversation with them. So twinsies. Um, so yeah, you can check that out. Uh, but lastly, if you want to, if you'd like to support the show and you don't want to spend any money at all, that's 100% a okay. You can do it through rate and review on Apple podcasts. Uh, the, the link to that page is in the description of this episode. The more reviews we get, the more it helps spread the word. And as we all know, the word is panic so for eric carter i am ryan lauer and until next time read more batman comics